It's a real honor to present our Patriot Award tonight to a dear friend, Lieutenant General Bill Burleson. I've known Bill since July 1984, when we both reported into West Point. I just realized that's about 40 years ago, which I think makes Bill really old, hopefully not me. But it's been a really long time. Bill has an incredible, uh, incredibly important position as the commander of the 8th Army, which would oversee all American and Korean troops in that area of the world. And obviously, with Kim Jong-un creating havoc on a regular basis, his troops are on the border only 20 miles from the nation's capital. It's an incredibly intense command and important command that Bill's in charge of, not to mention with all the issues going on in China. Bill flew, flew all the way here from Korea tonight, so it's a real blessing to have him. And just to give you a sense for, for what it's like to operate in Korea, the motto of our troops over there is be ready to fight tonight because the threat is that immediate and that present 24-7. So, Bill, thank you for what you and your troops do for us. I also wanted to give you a bit of a personal feel for Bill. Um, I do have some pictures of some parties that we went to in college together. <laughs> Unfortunately, he has pictures of me too, so they're out. No pictures. Um, but first thing is, we all knew Bill was going to be a general from the very early days. Um, we were in the same company together at West Point. We were in the same duty station in the Army. And we used to talk about it, that uh, all, all of his friends, that, you know, Bill was going to be a general. He just had that bearing. He had the leadership skills, the people skills. He just really stood out from the very early days. So none of us were surprised to see the great things that he's done. Secondly, he comes from a long line of service. His grandfather was a World War II veteran. His dad was a two-star general. His father-in-law was a colonel. And his son, Matt, who's here with us tonight, is a captain in the 82nd Airborne Division. Yeah. <laughs> but all that service comes at a tremendous personal cost, as you might imagine. He's been deployed many, many times, training exercises. He's missed too many anniversaries and birthdays and holidays for Cindy to be able to count. He and Cindy have been stationed in Korea for more than four years, which is much longer than, than usual because he's doing such a great job, but that's a very long time away from friends and family on the other side of the world. And he's also spent four and a half years in multiple combat deployments to Iraq and Afghanistan, including a tour where his son Matt was also doing a year-long combat tour in Afghanistan. And this is a picture of the two of them in 2016. But can you imagine what that was like for Cindy? To have a whole year with her boy and her husband, both deployed in combat in harm's way every minute of every day. She's an incredibly strong and resilient woman, as are all of our military spouses. And so let's please give her a big round of applause. So, Bill, it's a real honor to thank you and the men and women you lead for what you do for our country and your lifetime of service to our nation. Please join us on stage. Okay, well, I was sweating a little bit that Dave did actually have some photos. <laughs> And for the record, uh, my photos have been in storage now for four years. If any of you don't know anything about storage units in Tacoma, Washington, uh, please let me know. But it, it's really humbling to be here with you tonight and to receive this award. And, and up front, this evening is really about our Gold Star families and our children of the fallen. So it's very humbling to be here. And Dave, thanks for that kind introduction. And I, and I really am honored to accept this award on behalf of the men and women right now that stand watch in Korea. There's about 32,000 American, Korean soldiers and civilians uh, that as we speak live in the Republic of Korea. Some are on duty flying reconnaissance missions, others are manning integrated air and missile defense, others are on watch command centers, and there's some that were, are within meters of the North Korean border. 
And so while an armistice agreement was signed 69 years ago, an armistice is not peace. It's not a peace treaty. And there is a clear and present danger. And as, and as you can imagine, about a week ago, I was trying to put a few things on paper for tonight. And that's when our not so friendly guy to the north started his little tirade of firing off missiles, of which over three dozen entered South Korean and Japan waters over this last week. So it's a clear and present danger, and I'm accepting this award on behalf of all those that are there tonight standing watch. But Dave, yeah, thank you. Uh, but Dave and Cynthia, you know, thanks for what you do and really for all of you here tonight to support our Gold Star families and children of the fallen. I mean, just the, the short video, it's kind of like, man. And then seeing those wonderful young people up here who have been so successful as a result of the efforts and generosity of many, it's tremendously moving. And so when you look in Merriam-Webster's definition of gala, there's a couple, all of you that are watching football scores right now, <laughs> look up Merriam-Webster gala. And it actually talks about where it's an event to be, have a celebration, an event for celebration. Uh, but those military members, uh, whether it was combat or training, they're the ones that gave the ultimate sacrifice. So it's our Gold Star families that we recognize here tonight. And so as Dave mentioned, you know, we have known each other a while, uh, 38 years. Um, and we were part of the invasion of Panama together where sadly, but as a result of the death of Sergeant Gibbs, Dave got the great idea to create children of fallen patriots. And I, I would like to acknowledge up front uh, there are a special group of people here tonight that have also been part of that 38-year journey. The class of 1988 sitting over there and some in the back. Um, so um, our class motto was no task too great, but as a result of New York State changing their drinking laws while we were cadets, uh, we actually got another motto that was called the worst class ever. <laughs> Uh, but we survived, obviously, and a number of us have gone and done great things. Hey, so I had the privilege of being here for the very first Greenwich Gala. Um, anybody else here other than Dave and Cynthia here for that one? A few of you. Uh, you should all remember that there was this very meek and quiet uh, guest auctioneer who was also from Greenwich at the time called Kathy Lee Gifford. <laughs> and, and, and you can imagine the energy that was there that night. And that's the same energy that we feel here tonight. So I... I encourage you all to enjoy the evening as we think about what we can do for these wonderful families and children. But you and when you talk about the vision that Dave and Cynthia and the board have developed, where we talk about to ensure that every child of a fallen patriot receives necessary college funding. So I, I think about that a lot, not in the context of children of fallen patriots, but you know, as Dave mentioned, I'm in my fourth year of living in Korea and I mean, in 1950, a bunch of young Americans went over there. They didn't even know where Korea was. Um, and on July 5th of 1950, a very ill-prepared, ill-equipped American organization battalion, an infantry battalion called Task Force Smith, got into combat with the North Koreans, and they failed. They had to retreat. They withdrew with a lot of casualties. And that withdrawal and defeat occurred for several months until a perimeter was created around the city of Busan. And then eventually over the course of you know, three years, not just the Americans, but also the Korean forces and the United Nations sending states came back uh, to create the Korea that it is today. But um, people oftentimes say the forgotten war, we should not forget. There's 37,000 Americans that died there and 7,500 are still there alone, buried without anybody else next to him, as missing in action. And the remain, remain, remains recovery efforts go on today. Just like we will never forget the children of the fallen, we will never forget our fallen comrades. So we'll continue to do that. And so there's always gonna be a need, as long as we have armies, and as long as sometimes we have to settle uh, failures of policy through armed conflict, to support our Gold Star families and our children. So this is a part audience participation event, okay? 
Um, and it's not yelling out football scores. Um, but I did an unscientific poll of several of you in attendance here tonight a few weeks ago. For some of you, this will be easy. Others, you're going to have to take a little while. If you get past a minute, just stop, OK? I'm asking all of you to think about your first cognizant memory, for one of the first things you remember in life. For some of us, it was probably getting scolded for using, losing your boots in a snowstorm. Maybe it was a memory of a brother or sister. Maybe it was Christmas Day. Maybe you were scared of the way the light entered your room at night when your parents made you go to bed. But think about those first memories. All right, we all have them. They're all different. Some of them involve family. Imagine for those who've lost a parent if they have no memory of a parent because they never met them. Or if that waning memory of a parent is all that they have remaining. And so while we all have first memories, I would just ask you to keep in mind those that never met a parent and never made it back, or those that have a memory and that's all they have remaining. So thankfully, an organization like Children of Fallen Patriots can step in and fulfill some of that void by providing a guiding hand for our Gold Star families and our children of the fallen. They can't replace a loved one, but they can provide assistance on behalf of our grateful nation. And so there, I think there was an English poet that said, true warriors do not fight because they hate what is in front of them, but because he loves what is behind him. And that's all of you here, our country, and supporting our country and our military. And that's about service, sacrifice, and a grateful nation. So last week, uh, I actually flew back on Wednesday night, so 96 hours ago. But the week before, I was up on the demilitarized zone. Um, we were doing some work up there, and we were at a place called Bekma, which is White Horse. It's called White Horse Hill. And it literally sits like in between North and South Korea, but the way that the border was finished at the end of the war, it's actually in South Korea, but part of it is not. And so in the waning days of the war, um, that piece of land, Bekma or White Horse, changed hand 10 times. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth uh, over the course, actually 24 times over the course of 10 days. About 3,000 American, South Korean, French, Greek uh, died there, and about 14,000 Chinese people, volunteers, um, gave their life there. Uh, while losing that land. But I was up there with the group that was doing the remains recovery, and they said, yeah, we think there's 19 Americans here. And they pointed out where they thought they were, and they said, we can't get to them yet, but we will. And so you start thinking about that. that's 19 loved ones, that's 19 families, potentially 19 children, 19 spouses, 19 parents, sets of parents that never got anybody back. But I bring that up because what's happened in the past has happened in the last 20 years, even though we brought everybody home. And it will happen in the future. As much as we pray for peace, um, inevitably, those things will happen. And so an organization like Children of Fallen Patriots that cares for our children and our families is tremendously important. But sadly, this also extends into training. Um, while we can deliberately assess and mitigate risks, our nation's military, all branches of services, are the best because we really put rigor and realism into our training. Um, I attended this event in 2018, uh, a great, wonderful event like this. Um, the next morning, I woke up. I was in another job at that time. I was a division commander at Fort Lewis. Next, you know, it's always good when you get a phone call on Sunday morning, right? I mean, it's like... Okay, either did somebody, somebody did something stupid in a bar or it's not something good. In this case, we had a training exercise. This was the morning after this event. We had a training exercise ongoing, and they gave me a word. They said there's been a vehicle accident, and um, we're not sure if the soldier's going to make it. And about 45 minutes later, they, they, I got a call back, and they said he didn't make it. And um, so that was Sergeant Drew Waters. He died the day after we did this event, and he left a wife and a son that wasn't even three months old. 
That son never had a first memory of his dad. And so um, some of these things hit pretty close to home. This last Friday night was the 30th anniversary of uh, a training exercise that we did. I know for some of you that's like, it's like I wasn't even alive 30 years ago. Where's that group of cadets over there? All right, yeah, they weren't even alive. We did a joint special operations training exercise where we flew a bunch of airplanes and helicopters from the East Coast out to Salt Lake City. And you know, it was a big desert, right? So remember around that time, uh, this was post-desert storm, but we were still concerned about the things Iraq was up to. We were gonna do a big rehearsal of an airfield seizure out in the desert of Utah. And it was a dark and stormy night. Uh, a lot of the aircraft broke. But in the end, the training exercise was a go. We were gonna jump in a bunch of rangers and then there was a, a special operations task force that was going in by helicopter. So you can imagine flying out of Salt Lake City in the rain and in a storm, you know, all the lights of Salt Lake City flying into the desert, right? And over the Great Salt Lake. I mean, you go from complete light to complete darkness. And in a sadly, in a rainstorm, a flight of four aircraft they had to do a breakup procedure, and one crashed into uh, the Salt Lake. We put an aircraft down, a bunch of rangers rode out in a boat. Sadly, the only person they could save was the pilot. That night, uh, five rangers and seven Air Force commandos died. And they were, it was one of these things that happens, you know, where load plans get shifted around as aircraft break. But on there, you had about three very senior leaders, people that couldn't be replaced. This last, I saw the video uh, yesterday. They rededicated the monument out there, and you had the families out there. And they were, one, proud of their parents' sacrifice, but we can never forget their sacrifices that occur in combat as well as in training. And so uh, before I sort of get into the transition, there's, there's one last thing I got to tell you. It's never... Uh, <laughs> So 16 January 2019, I woke up to do, uh, you know, just like any of you, your normal morning things, right? For me, it's get up, have a cup of coffee, put on my PT gear, um, turn on the morning news. You know, I was on the West Coast, so you can catch the, the East Coast morning news, right? And then go to work and do exercise with a bunch of young people, right? <laughs> um, so it's a great way to start a day. So that morning I got up, I put on my PT gear, sitting there having a cup of coffee, and uh, news comes on, and it says, you know, uh, there was a suicide, ISIS suicide bomber um, that struck a, a place in Manbij, Syria, and there, there's been American casualties. Now, uh, we never really had a lot of people in Syria. You know, it was a special operations element, and uh, it was supported by some American infantry. Um, and this was about two hours before my wife gets up and watches the Today Show, right? So I'm sitting there going, okay, it's five in the morning. She's not going to be up for another couple hours. But, you know, um, Manbij, Syria is not a big town. And my son's there. And uh, so, you know, I'm like, I'm a soldier and I'm a dad, right? And so I know how the drill works. You know, I mean, they have all our information and things like that. And so I'm sitting there going, man... Is that car going to come to the house? I mean, they certainly know where to find me, right? Um, and then, you know, it came out that there were four Americans killed um, there that day. My son was not one. Uh, but um, the four great Americans, um, one was a Green Beret uh, warrant officer named Jonathan Farmer, father of four. Another one was Navy cryptological technician Shannon Kent mother of two, a former Navy SEAL who was now working as a DOD civilian, and then a Department of Defense interpreter. And thank goodness there was a young infantry lieutenant, uh, my son that was there to help recover them and bring them home. So on behalf of those that have given their lives and protect our values and our way of life, I'm sincerely grateful for all that you do for our children of the fallen. You've seen their success here tonight, and it's only possible because of what you do 
and what children of the fallen patriots do. We know you got our back, and that will allow us to do what we need to do. So there's a quote that I actually learned in a book when I was a cadet. I might have actually stayed awake in that class. So Jack, you can sit. as you teach those young cadets, you can have hope that maybe they actually do retain a little something. It's from a book called This Kind of War, and it's an epic history of the Korean War by a guy named T.R. Fehrenbach. And I think it shows you the importance of children of fallen patriots, not just today, but into the future as you look at history. And so this is what it says. Americans in 1950 rediscovered something that since Hiroshima they had forgotten. You may fly over land forever. You may bomb it, atomize it, pulverize it, and wipe it clean of life. But if you desire to defend it, protect it, and keep it for civilization, you must do this on the ground, the way the Roman legions did, by putting your young men in the mud. So my challenge to you today is to not just think of the past or think of the present, but also think of the future. We live in a very uncertain world, one where several regimes that oppose our values, democracy, and our way of life seek to change, seek to replace the United States as a superpower. And while we all pray for peace, we must remain ready and prepared. And your actions to take care of our Gold Star families and their children ensure that we're ready. So as I conclude, I'm going to finish where I started. And that's to express my admiration to our Gold Star families and specifically the children of the fallen. You know, they did not get a choice in this. And their loved ones gave it all the ultimate sacrifice for our country and our way of life. And for that, we must be forever grateful and never, ever forget them. To the children of the fallen that are here tonight, you are their legacy and we are tremendously proud of you. Your parents, your loved ones, gave their tomorrows for our todays. So thank you. And to all of you in attendance here tonight, thank you again for your support of our servicemen and women and for our Gold Star families. David and Cynthia, and your whole Children of Fallen Patriots team, what a marvelous thing you've done. I remember when this was just an idea, and it's really done something special, and it will be enduring. What you do to support the Children of Fallen is, tr is truly special, and it's an honor to accept this award here today on behalf of all those young men and women that stand watch in the Republic of Korea. Thank you. Have a great evening.